Let's talk about the Fed meeting. So in just 24 hours, we have a make or break moment um, and everything could change really in the U.S. economy based on what the Fed decides. Everyone is waiting with bated breath. What will the Fed do? So more on that piece of it in a minute. But first, it's your fault. It's your fault, guys, um, that banks are collapsing. Did you know that? It's your fault that you want your own money out of your own banks. You're the problem, according to the criminal bankers and politicians running this clown show. Those are the words basically coming out of the mouths of the CEO of Credit Suisse, which just collapsed. It's the big bank that just collapsed, losing billions in deposits for its clients. And by the way, we should point out Credit Suisse has been on the decline for like a decade now. So the trajectory for Credit Suisse has been there, and but they want to blame you. Um, asked by a reporter yesterday, hey, what caused this collapse? The CEO of Credit Suisse had the balls to blame social media and Twitter and people who are worried about their money um, you know, because of a collapse. So it's your fault. It's Twitter's fault. It's people talking about their own money. It's your fault. Watch. Who is responsible for this disaster? Schauen Sie. Well, Rückwärts zu look, ist immer einfach und hindsight is wonderful. Es ist einfach eine and to point a finger, it's a fact sicherlich seit 2021 that mit since 2021, with uh, a Jado, so we never left the headlines. We were overtaken by legacy situations, by risks that materialized last year. We were affected by a market model that does no longer work in this market environment. And many clients have been very loyal for a very long time. And last autumn, we had this social media storm, and this had huge repercussions, more in the retail sector than in the wholesale sector, and too much becomes too much. And that's when we reach this point. It's accumulation of various facts that contributed to one another and then materialized at some point. So it's social media. It's people talking on Twitter and who are concerned about their money and then went and wanted to take money out of the bank. So it's your fault. It's your fault that, you know, and Twitter's fault, basically, that your entire industry is built on a lie. This whole banking industry is built on a lie. Uh, a bank should never say too much is too much. Like <laughs> right. every single unit of currency should be accounted for. There should not be too much that you want of your currency inside the bank. No, it's That's your fault. That's a terrifying thing to it's say. It's your fault that you put a hundred bucks in the bank and you want to get your hundred bucks out. That's your fault. That's too much is too much. Because the real secret, of course, is that they don't have any of your money. right? So That's then the how truth. much is too much for you to want of your own money? 50%? You're not even supposed to talk about how much you want. Like not even not even 10% because they don't have that either. So you're not allowed to talk about it. And if you're concerned about it on social media, then you're causing other people to also be concerned about it about their own money in their own bank, and it's your fault. Hmm. Too much is too much, they say. It's about not your technically own money. with fractional, with yeah. fractional banking, your dollar is negative ten dollars. I mean, at least it yeah. it should be right. Like it, it, they can loan out ten times what you give them. Yeah. Here's a tweet that I think he nails it. Listen to this. Operation Libertas says translation. We no longer have control of the narrative through legacy media, corporate press, and people are starting to learn the truth about our corrupt global fractional reserve system. What David's talking about, of course, is fractional reserve banking, which is you put $100 into a bank, they only have to keep 10% of it. 10% is historically what they had to keep. They could lend out the other 90 in the form of mortgages and loans and everything else. And they only had to keep 10% on file, right? Now, during COVID 2020, the law was changed to zero. They don't have to keep 10%. They don't, they only have, they have to keep zero of your money. You bring $100 to them, they don't even have to keep 10% of it on the, on file. So 
what happens when all, all these people suddenly want their money back? Well, guess what? They don't have it because they do risky investments, right? The, and we know this from the FDIC meeting, the FDIC meeting with the leaked video where the FDIC admits that the banking industry is a joke built on a house of lies. They also admit during that meeting that it, it's best we don't tell the masses of people about this because if they find out, they may actually want their money back. So only tell the rich people, only tell the billionaires, or they'll probably have a legal team that's sophisticated enough to figure it out. But please don't tell anybody about it. Don't use social media to let the cat out of the bag. And today we're seeing this fallout spreading to small regional banks and credit unions. Many of you have actually been emailing us asking about credit unions. People are saying, well, I bank at a credit union. Am I okay? Well, we've had, uh, we've, um, we at Redacted have been hearing from a number of different people who work at credit unions uh, that there are being laid off. There's layoffs happening across the board at a number of different credit unions. One particular credit union employee wrote to us saying that she discovered the credit union she worked for was $2 million in the red. And then when she confronted her boss about it, uh, what are we going to do about this? Um, he said, basically, she's like, how are we going to correct this? He said, we're going to have to lay people off. And that's exactly what happened. She lost her job. So she was a person that lost her job. Um, and how many more people are being laid off because they can't balance their books. So this is happening at small regional banks um, and credit unions across the country with the rise of interest rates. And these banks have been crushed because they rely so heavily on local mortgages, right? So a lot of these small banks rely on these mortgages. Here's the Wall Street Journal this morning with this piece. SVB collapse shows smaller banks can pose risks in numbers. And what they point out in this piece is that for 15 years, regulators and legislators have assumed that the biggest risks to the financial system came from a handful of too big to fail banks. Little did they think that all those little banks with a few billion here and a few billion there would add up to a lot of billions. So when those start to fall, they've been focused on the wrong fish, right? They've been looking at the big guys when in fact, wait a minute, if all of the little guys fall, all of those little dominoes fall. That's a lot of money, and that's a lot of communities that will be screwed and small businesses that have small business loans, all sorts of things through these small community banks. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and that's what, what ends up crisis. happening is, yeah, and what ends up happening is these little banks are making actual investments into the community. They're the ones loaning your houses. They're the ones credit unions are doing loans for cars and stuff like that at better interest rates. Then when this happens... And these big banks that have all the money, they swoop in and buy these little banks. And then all of a sudden now you're in a fractional banking system because they just like opened up the market for them. To, like there was a right. Washington Mutual Bank and all these little yeah. banks that that I really enjoyed being part of that just got sucked up in the in the, the bailout and became part of Chase and Bank of America. So they just keep getting bigger and they keep getting rid of these little banks. Yeah. I feel like it's designed by design. Well, well, a lot of times when you bank with a small bank, they sell your loan anyway, and they in order to make money on it, and they sell it into a larger banking system, um, which is allowed. But the there's a compendium of smaller banks that have been pushing back against increasing regulation and increasing reporting requirements that the Biden administration continues to want to push back and say, this is going to put us out of business. The big banks can do it, but we can't. So there does seem to be an appetite from the Biden administration administration uh, to unduly burden small community banks and by extension, then small business. Yeah. As Peter Schiff says, this is a banking crisis, where however you want to slice it. The media is reluctant to call what's happening with banks a financial crisis as they do not want to invite comparisons to 2008. But the 2008 financial crisis was also a banking crisis. Not only is the current crisis a sequel to 2008, but like all sequels, it will be much worse. Except for The Godfather. Godfather 2 was And great. apparently John Wick. John Wick. John yeah. Wick 4 is the highest rated now in the franchise. So, um, so well, not, not all sequels. Doesn't, doesn't, it, suck. Yeah. doesn't it seem more logical then that you would let the big banks fail and prop up the little ones if they're the majority of the problem here? Like no, because as Carol Roth points out in her great book, The War on Small Business, because small businesses are wily and you cannot control them. Uh, the government wants to make broad strokes, as you've seen, uh, the way they control the conversation, not through sort of next door or what have you. They control the conversation through Twitter. And the Fed even admitted this. Remember, guys, back a few years ago when we were getting the stimulus plans and, of course, the Fed, Federal Reserve had that that small banking facility that they put out there, the small business facility. They created some of these like community facilities and they admitted they're like, 
No one's using them. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to reach these small businesses. We just don't have the mechanisms to talk to these small businesses. We just don't know how to talk to them and get in front of them and let them know that they have these things available. It's very easy for us to just walk down the street to J.P. Morgan Chase. Yeah, I have that guy on my speed dial. But these small little communities, you know, little hair salons and play, they, we don't know who they are. Yeah, Federal Reserve was admitting to this, to your point. So if you believe this is all part of the plan, like we here at Redacted do, and just like what David was talking about, consolidate power, um, take, this, take the power of the small banks, put the power in the hands of a few big New York banks, then you won't be surprised what happens tomorrow if the Federal Reserve raises rates. Because if they do that, that will crush a lot of these small banks who rely on these mortgages. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen last week gave us a preview of exactly what we'll see when she admitted they were perfectly happy, you know, bailing out billionaires in Silicon Valley. But when pressed on, hey, what about all these small banks in Oklahoma, as one member of Congress was asking in his backyard, um, how are they going to be protected? Here was her response. Will the deposits in every community bank in Oklahoma, regardless of their size, be fully insured now? Are they fully recovered? Every bank, every community bank in Oklahoma, regardless of the size of the deposit, will they get the same treatment that SVBP just got or Signature Bank just got? A bank only gets that treatment if a majority of the FDIC board, a supermajority, a supermajority of the Fed board, and I, in consultation with the president, determine that the failure to protect uninsured depositors would create systemic risk and significant economic and financial consequences. So what is and your we plan? Made that determination. Right. right. So, so what is your banks. plan to keep large depositors from moving their funds out of community banks into the big banks? We have seen the mergers of banks over the past decade I'm concerned you're about to accelerate that by encouraging anyone who has a large deposit in a community bank to say, we're not going to make you whole, but if you go to one of our preferred banks, we will make you whole at that point. Um, look, I mean, we're, that's certainly not something that we're encouraging. That is happening right now. That is happening because that's that, that's uh, your yeah. treasury. How do people like that ascend to power? That's your treasury secretary <laughs> yeah, well, of the United States. Well, what I what I heard that that first answer when when he's like, "How do you determine?" And they're like, "Well, the super majority of the of the of the board." Like she's basically saying, "It just really depends on how many of the ultra wealthy are gonna are gonna be inconvenienced out of this. Yeah. If, yeah. The, if a bunch of ultra wealthy are gonna be uh, hurt, hit, hurt with this, then yeah, we'll we'll completely bail them out. But if only like." marginally wealthy people are going to be hurt by this screw them yeah and, and basically yeah. she's like if i get a phone call from the president because you know she got a phone call from somebody at jp morgan and then that's when i in consultation with the president decide and make that determination so you're telling me all these little small banks in oklahoma are they going to rise to the level of getting you on the phone no they're not these people are screwed and these small banks are screwed. And that's exactly what's happening right now. So in the past week, the Fed added $300 billion to its balance sheets. Look at this. The past week, $300 billion. So to absorb these large bank problems, Silicon Valley Bank, right? And paying off Silicon Valley Bank. So tomorrow, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell uh, can tilt the world into a recession or depression. He can literally, he can will, he can, um, he can, he can forever change the status of the dollar. And we'll have to face brutal questioning, of course, about the bailouts and about missing the, the systemic risks. How did you guys miss this? How did you not see this? Um, the truth is actually more complicated than all of that. When the Fed did their stress tests on the bank, this is amazing. They didn't even test for this shit. So they basically tested a scenario that is actually pretty laughable. Listen to this. It's like, they, it's like one of those crappy PCR tests that they were using during COVID. And we give a positive result by just by swabbing like underneath a monkey's armpit. Like it'll just give you a positive result no matter what. Here's what they tested for. They tested what would happen if inflation falls to 1.25%. Okay, it was around two for years. What would happen if it falls to 1.25% and interest rates drop to zero. That was their test. Seriously, they never tested for what we're seeing now, which is skyrocketing inflation 
and interest rates at 7%. Wow. They did the opposite. They're like, what would happen if we started to look like Europe? I mean, given that we were in almost double digits most of the 2022, you'd think they would just quickly run some models. Yeah. Like napkin. <laughs> Back of the napkin novel. Shit. No. Yeah. This morning, I just finished reading an amazing newsletter report. I subscribed to them on the Fed policies and their significant structural problems. I'll have a link to their newsletter report in the description. It's really good. One of the things that this Fed watcher uh, points out in this report is that the Fed is chasing trends. Regardless of what you think about the Fed, and I think we should abolish the Fed. I've been pretty vocal about that. The Fed is chasing trends that are impossible to reverse. You got to read this report. Anyway, I think it's very, very important because the U.S. dollar is basically built on a lie. And no amount of Fed movement is going to change that. This lie still exists even if the rates move up or down. It doesn't matter. The fundamentals are there. If the Fed raises interest rates tomorrow... They officially kill the small banks that rely on mortgages. That means first-time home buyers can't afford a mortgage. The housing market grinds to a halt. In April, April and May, two of the best houses, two of the best months for housing, right? You're going to see more houses go on the market in April and May. That's usually when the best time to sell a house is, right? Also the best time to buy a house and you get in bidding wars. It's kind of crazy. Um, and it's going to make retirement a hell of a lot more difficult for people. Uh, this is punishing the 401k plan. If the if Powell raises rates tomorrow, it makes credit more expensive, which lowers the valuations of stocks and bonds. Um, and if Powell doesn't raise rates tomorrow and they stay the same, then, of course, inflation remains strong. They continue to print money. In other words, the Fed is painted into a corner that they can't get out of. They waited too long to raise rates. They waited too long to pull back on printing money. It was always going to be painful, but now they made it that much worse by waiting to do anything about it. So I, I'll ask you guys the question, do you think they're going to protect your 401k tomorrow? Do you think that they, or your mortgage, or do you think that they're going to protect the big banks tomorrow? Like that's the big question. Let me know in Here the comments in below. <laughs> Here in the United States, do you think they're, they're going to protect protecting you? They're protecting their pensions. They're protecting all that. Yeah. yeah, but they won't protect us in that way. Uh, I think the Monopoly board sums up our banking system perfectly. Here it is. This is a Monopoly rule. If you open up the Monopoly board and you ask the question, well, what if the bank runs out of money? Some players think the bank is bankrupt if it runs out of money. The bank never goes bankrupt. To continue playing, use slips of paper to keep track of each player's banking transactions until the bank has had enough, enough paper money to operate again. The banker may also issue, quote, new money on slips of ordinary paper. Okay. That's the Monopoly board, which sums up our entire banking industry in the United States perfectly well. I mean, I just want to treat life like a game like that from yeah. now on. Be like, hmm. Oh, I got some paper. What is what it is. Oh, we don't have any money? Well, okay, let's start, let me just I'm draw start someone on groceries napkin. that way. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to declare that I never run out of money. And so anytime I want to buy something, <laughs> I'm just going to be like, oh, actually, here, this is some paper. It's just you hang on to this. And when I have money, I'll give it to you. It's an IOU. This is good. It's like in Dumb and Dumber when, you know, they have all the IOUs. It's like, it's, it's, it's basically just the same thing. It's as good as the money. Oh, yeah. You know, here's just a box of IOUs. What is this? Yeah. Oh, I'm good for that. I'm good for that. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.